I'm back. It's been a little while. I've been traveling to Europe for work related reasons those past few weeks and since I reached 1000 subscribers I've been thinking how can I bring this channel to the next level. So I spoke to Paddy Galloway, this guy is like a genius YouTube scientist, he has worked with huge creators and I have some exciting news at the end of this video. But first I want to answer a few questions that you guys had, so let's get started. First question is from Tyler, any side project you're working on? Well, there are a couple. Uh, I have a full-time job, so I have some of my evenings and weekends free. YouTube right now takes most of my time. I have to think about ideas, prepare them, script, film. Besides that, I have The Last Code Bender. It's an idea I'm exploring as part of a YouTube video series. But I have also a third project, which is completely unrelated to coding or this channel. It's um, the manga. Because I actually love reading mangas and I love inspirational stories. I believe those can sometimes have much more impact than traditional education. Because that really touches people, right? And uh, for a couple of years now, I've wanted to create the story of a little boy from the mountains of Ingushetia. That's my homeland. That's where I come from. It's a small region in the Caucasus who is on a quest to find his missing father. This manga is very dear to my heart because it's the first Muslim hero manga and it's also the first manga featuring my homeland. It's something I've never done before, so I don't really have any experience. I'm just learning as I go. And it's more of a long-term project, like uh, I plan most likely to do it really in like 10 years or so. Right now I'm just planting the seeds, watering them throughout time and then in roughly 10 years, uh, that's when I want to get really serious with it and publish it and, and make it grow, hopefully. Next question, how did you reach 1000 subscribers with only 27 videos? That's funny because I actually thought 27 was a lot, but then I checked the stats. It takes on average 164 videos to reach 1000 subscribers. Of course, that's the average. This means that some people do it in much less, some people do it in much more. Few tips that I could give, um, like I'm not an expert also, like I don't have like that much, that much success yet with YouTube, but the few things that I've noticed is it helps a lot if you can identify your target audience early. So you have to know for who are you making those videos basically, like who is the target and how would they value from having that content. Because YouTube is a little bit like a business really. Like if you want to do it seriously, if you want to scale and make a living out of it, you have to think about it like a business. So for business, you need to identify who your customers are. So customers is basically the viewers for YouTube. And then you need to give them a product, right? You need to sell them a product that answers some kind of need that they have that solves some kind of problem for them. Or basically just something that they want. And the equivalent of that product is for YouTube is your videos, right? You need to create videos that are valuable for that target audience based on what they're looking for. The second one is think about discoverability. So YouTube at the beginning, if you're going to post your videos, no one is going to see them, right? Because the algorithm is not going to push you as soon as you get started. So your first videos, they might get just like a few views. You might get one, two, three views unless you share them with your friends, so then it will be your friends and family who will view them. But otherwise, you need to think, how can I get my videos to be discovered? One way is uh, videos that get searched. So you have to think about YouTube as a search engine, right? Like a lot of people still search on YouTube to find certain videos. Think about how can you make video topics that people search for. For me, for example, my most viewed video is one that is 80% of the traffic comes from search. It's a Fiverr game development video. Like every day I get views there, I get subscribers coming from there. That's like a good tactic. Another one could be to share in different places, right? If you can share with some blogs, if you can share on the Reddit. Basically, you want to create those avenues where people can discover your content and then hopefully if it's good enough with time, the YouTube algorithm picks it up and then recommends it and your, your channel grows like that. Andrews asks, how is your visa situation in the US? So I came to the US as a student to do my master's degree at UCLA. Uh, it was a master's in electrical and computer engineering. So I got the student visa. Basically, I was uh, like just to give a short summary of my of my path. I did my undergrad in Belgium, then I wanted to come to the US. So I applied to several colleges for a master's degree. I got accepted to UCLA, that was my favorite choice. So I went there. I also got a scholarship from Belgium. Otherwise, I mean, there was no way I could have afforded education in the US, just too expensive. But anyways, once you get accepted at a US college, you will be able to apply for an F1 visa. That's like a visa that's given to every student. It's pretty straightforward. You go to your, your embassy, like the US embassy in your country. You have an appointment, they ask you a few questions and usually you'll be able to get that visa basically. I got the visa for five years. The master's degree lasts for two years. So once you're done with your master's, um, you're able to apply for what's called an OPT. An OPT is like a work permit. It's valid for one year. You can work in the US. On your student visa, you're still allowed to work on that OPT and it's pretty easy to get if you have an employer. After that, if you are a student from a STEM field, so like 
science, technology, engineering, or math, you're allowed to apply for a two-year extension of your OPT. It's called the STEM OPT extension. And this means that you will have access to up to three years of work permit under this F1 visa. And that's pretty easy to get. Like you just apply and then it's pretty much guaranteed that you'll have it if you have an employer. So that's my situation. I'm reaching the end of that STEM OPT extension. I have like a little bit more than a month left on that. What people typically do after that is that they try to get the H1B. So H1B is the typical work uh, visa that, that you have but for that you need an employer who is willing to sponsor you so if you work at the company they're willing to sponsor you then they apply it's a lottery so there's no guarantee you'll get the h1b but if you do get it you can stay in the us for three years and i believe you can renew it as many times as you want so that's like the standard typical path and if you have plans to stay long term in the us you can consider applying for a green card um and then after five years of a green card i think you can apply for citizenship in the us so that's also something that, that people do. So just like as a summary, the timeline for me was two years of master's degree on an F1 visa, then one year of OPT work permit where I worked at a startup, then two years of STEM OPT extension. And then now I'm, I'm applying for the H1B, which will also like hopefully give me three years. And then, then we'll see what happens. Like I take it step by step. Basically. Next question is from John. What's harder for you, learning a new verbal language or learning a new coding language? That's funny because I speak three languages. I speak English, French, and Russian, and I'm learning a fourth language right now, which is English. That's the language of my people, my, my, and my homeland. The reason why I don't speak it really is because I wasn't raised there, and also it's the typical situation where when an outside force <laughs> takes over your land, right, and they impose their language as, as the state language, so in this case Russian, becomes a state language, so people speak it in schools, at work, then they get too used to it, they speak it at home with their kids, so kids grow up and they don't know the, their own language. But yeah, anyway, so as I'm learning a new language right now, I can really compare how is it to learn a new language, a new verbal language, versus learning a new programming language. And for sure, without any doubt, learning a programming language is much easier. Because once you know one language and you know the basic principles and concepts of that language, uh, or, or just principles for programming in general, like how variables work, functions, objects, things like object-oriented programming, functional programming, like once you understand those things, it's pretty easy to learn a new language in general, like most of the time. So for example, for me, if let's say I know I only know JavaScript and I want to learn Python, I could basically learn it in one day. Like in one day, I would be able to write Python code. Like I won't be a proficient programmer, but I would be able to write most of the things that I want in one day. And also I would be able to read Python code. So it means that it's like both ways communication, right? It's like I can communicate myself by writing code and I can read the code of someone else. But that's something that is impossible to do with a verbal language. So for example, if I take Spanish right now and I wanna learn it in one day, I mean, I would be able to say a few words, but that's it basically. I wouldn't be able to go outside and speak with people and understand what they're saying, right? But that is possible with a new programming language. So it's much easier. Next question is from Ahmed. Can you give some examples of what a growth engineer does? Yeah, so I recently switched jobs from being a software engineer at a young startup to become a growth engineer at a bigger startup and uh, growth engineering is still relatively new not that many people know about it but more and more companies are hiring for that position and I believe it has uh, like a good future because basically it's very similar to what a software engineer is like you still code every day but a growth engineer focuses specifically on growth initiatives so it's building features that help the business get more users that's basically what it is to grow essentially. So a typical example of that could be, for example, a referral system. Like let's say you wanna, you have a certain amount of users, right? For your, your business and you wanna get more of them. You wanna get more customers. So you build a referral system. But the thing is that you don't necessarily know like what kind of incentive would work best. Like would people prefer to have a month subscription free for every referral that they give? Or would they like to unlock some new features or would they like to get something else? You wanna be able to test that. You wanna be able to test different, A-B test essentially different incentives across different groups of users. And that's basically what we do. We create a lot of those A-B test experiments for different things. Also, for example, where do you want that referral button to be or that referral text, how, how it should be displayed? Or like in which stage of the user experience do you want to prompt a user to refer, for example. So testing all of these different variations to find the most optimal way that will drive the highest amount of growth, that's basically the role of a growth engineer. So it's a role that combines coding with ideation, creativity, and a little bit of marketing. So it's a very exciting position. I'm very happy. Next question, and then I'll talk about the future of this channel. Imran asks, what's your advice to young computer engineering students? All right, so I will try to answer this as the advice that I would have told myself if I was just starting right now. Coding is something that when you're just beginning to learn it, it will make you feel sometimes that you're an absolute idiot, that you're, there's no way you can understand this, that maybe other people get it, but your brain is not 
like wired to be able to understand this and become a good coder. The reality is that I believe a lot of the human population will be able to code and will be able to be like pretty decent at it if they were taught the right way. Because coding is just taught whether you learn it at college, university or like online classes, it's usually just extremely boring. It's not really done in a way that is um, that is optimized for the human brain. Like that's my opinion. So a much better approach that I believe would yield better results for a lot of people is if you know why do you want to code in the first place like try to define like what is your motivation for learning how to code that's number one number two is you select once you know that try to find something cool like an exciting project maybe a startup idea that you want or something in your daily life like a piece of software that you found, think would be really cool maybe it could be even a game that you think is just cool that you want to see in the real world and start building that don't try to follow like long courses and just get lost in a ton of different tutorials. Take that project that you find exciting that is just naturally motivating to you and just start with that. So first step is, okay, like I wanna build an app. I don't know how to get started. I don't know how to do the basic setup of the app and I don't know which languages to use. So just Google that. Then you, you read that, it will take you some time. You're gonna do it. You create like this basic setup of your app and then you're like, okay, like I wanna build a homepage, for example, or I wanna build a sign up form. And then you Google that, you search, you find, you get your answer and then, then you move basically step by step like that. Sometimes some steps will require you like a decent amount of time. It's not as if it's like a two minute Google search, right? Sometimes you will have to take even a course between two steps. The thing is that now you know exactly why you're doing that course and you have a purpose behind it. So it's much more exciting because you know, there was something that I was thinking also not long ago is in our modern world, coding is probably the closest we have to a superpower because you can literally take an idea you have in your brain, you can build it and then if you deploy it online, potentially you make it accessible to the entire planet. And if you do something useful and something cool, like something that solves a problem, it literally can create a huge impact. And for that, you basically just need a computer and an internet connection. You don't need a giant factory that, that manufactures products, a supply chain, millions of dollars of investments. So it really is like a superpower. And as we go in the future, it's just gonna become more and more true. And that's the change that I wanna make to this channel. I wanna start making videos where I build cool apps from scratch. And I wanna create this community of like code benders who shape the world around them building those cool types of softwares. So if you have any ideas of apps you want me to build or problems to tackle, drop them below and I will see you very soon. God bless.